And so it's my honor and privilege to uh, introduce Grace Wang, Dr. Grace Wang, who uh, will be speaking on behalf of NSF. We have uh, two uh, presentations that are the NSF folks, the leadership team, which we thank very much for encouraging the organization and, this, and providing the support for this workshop. She is the, uh, Grace is the Deputy Assistant Director for Engineering at NSF. Before that, she was the Division Director of the Division of Industrial Innovation Partnerships. And her background is both with NSF and before that in industry. So she has that nice knowledge of how to combine research with uh, universities and with industry. And that's one of the major themes here today. Grace, welcome. Good morning. So um, welcome to the workshop. And on behalf of my colleagues here, I would like to thank um, Dr. Dick Larson, Dr. Kent Larson, and Dr. Uh, Bill Ross, and also Dr. Uh, James Barra for organizing this workshop. And so we have been talking about the smart service system at NSF for uh, almost two years here. and. We have trying very hard, hoping that we can come up with a very tangible and solid research agenda. So what I'm going to do this morning, since that's really the ultimate goal, at least that's in my mind, is the ultimate goal of this workshop. So I'm going to go through something really basic with you to share with you at this time at National Science Foundation, what kind of definition we have adopted in terms of these three words, Actually, only the, the first two, smart and service, and why do we do that? And of course, I welcome all your constructive criticism on these definitions, and that's actually the whole point of this, that we need to define the scope and also the research agenda of this and see how we're going to move forward. So with that, let me tell you a little bit. This is a, absolutely a made-up story, but it's, nothing, it's not very far from the reality here. That if there is a little person here, let's call him Bob. And so Bob actually got a laptop. And so Bob, uh, in that laptop, of course, there's a hard disk drive. And this is not a regular hard disk drive. This hard disk drive is a smart hard disk drive that can collect all the information about how Bob is using this hard disk drive. And so Bob, how frequently Bob dropped off his uh, laptop on the floor, and how frequently Bob's dog has been sitting on the laptop, and how frequently he has to go in and out and bring the laptop into a very tropical area that's probably going to cause corrosion. So that's all the information they are, they are collecting about the user information there. And that information will go to a data center that collect all the information and then uh, connect to a log smart logistic platform. Not only can predict how, when this laptop, this hard disk drive is going to fail, but at the same time, based on the user behavior, understand what is really the, the better product for Bob since Bob is using his laptop in this way, and connect with the factory's logistics to figure out when they should to produce that um, you know, better model of the hard disk drive and then through a transportation system ship that hard disk drive to Bob before his hard disk drive failed. And so in this system, it's just a very, very simple story here, but if you can think about this, is the ultimate goal here is to serve Bob better. There is also other people in here, is actually the people working in the factory and even in the transportation. This group of people, we help by doing all this, improve their productivity. So that also is adding value to the group of people. And with that, this is the definition we have adopted at NSF on service. And you can see this is heavily based on the work of uh, uh, Dr. James uh, Sporo and Maglio and also uh, many others, that we believe the service is human-centered. We believe there must be interactions between people and also the physical and the virtual realities. And there must be value creation or co-creation. 
So with that, it's very natural if you think about what is a service system. A service system is a system that be, with the interaction between the human world, the physical reality, and the virtual reality by integrating all the enabling technologies with the goal to serve people better. And that's providing value to human beings. So that's a service system. And Alice called this a social technical system, which uh, I think it's a term that we can discuss. I usually don't use that term. And so what is a smart service system then? So this is the five features we summarized, what we believe is a smart service system. And actually, if you think about the Bob's story on the hard disk drive, the smart service system is a system that's capable of learning, capable of dynamic adaptation, and based on the data they received, the system has received, transmitted, and processed, it's capable of decision making. And based on the decision making, it can respond in the real time, or at least in the reasonable time. And with all this, again, the goal is to create value to humans. So that's the ser smart service systems. So when we think about this, if you think about the application of this, of course, it's very broad. And that's one of the challenges to come up with a very solid research agenda. And you think there is a could be, uh, a, uh, it's actually the applications can be smart manufacturing. I already gave you that, uh, that example there. And it could be smart cities. The personalized education could be smart agriculture, uh, personalized uh, healthcare or smart connected healthcare. It could be smart transportation. The list can go on and on. You can use all your imagination there. But what uh, these are all environment created by this smart service system. What underneath this is essentially has something common. Is this smart, the design of this smart service system that we need to integrate enabling technologies into this. But what behind this smart service system is the real challenge we are facing today is what are the fundamental knowledge and principles we need to really enable this smart service system? And I understand that's tomorrow's uh, agenda, right? The whole focus. And today, we're focusing on the how to incorporate and integrate all the technologies into the smart service system to re-innovate and enable all this uh, smart environment. And when we think about this, it's very essential to think that in this context, it's very important we understand the reality, understand who we are serving, especially in this context of a human-centered, that we know we need to understand the customer's needs, understand the, all this, um, the market need, and also understand the future market need, means we understand the future human behavior and social behavior. So that is essential. That's why it's essential that there must be academic industry collaboration. And this collaboration shouldn't stop at a translational research stage. Should be all the way go to the fundamental research because ultimately, at the, at the very beginning when we start thinking about the system architecture, we need to understand who are we serving and what is the human behavior and social behavior in there. And so that's why we believe that the deep understanding of reality of this uh, research is really make it very, very essential that we talk about academic and industry partnership. And that's the focus of today. And so when we talk about academic industry partnership, uh, people always think about the word tech transfer, which I'm absolutely not a big fan of. And this is tech, the word tech transfer comes from a deep, uh, with a deep root actually in this uh, concept of linear innovation model in which that the universities will create the knowledge and transfer the knowledge to the industry. The industry will translate that into the product and services and sell it into the customer. And of course the tax goes back to the government and government found the fundamental research, absolutely a one way street. But that's not the reality. Everybody who has funded a product before will agree with me that 
I, the reality is, it's very convoluted. It's, the innovation process is absolutely nonlinear. Within any time, when starting from the time that a basic research concept is conceived to the time it's translated into a product that people can use or service people can uh, benefit from, it, there is many stages at, at any given time. You can back and forth through and many and many stages, and this is actually from the 2012 PCAST report talking about the paradigm shift that we need to have about how to understand if there is really going to have a, base, a boundary between basic research and translational research. And if you think about it, I put an arrow here for you to look at the timeline. If we want to improve the effectiveness of the R&D investment we have today across the United States, which is a totally different topic, but actually that's a very, very critical thing to think about, how to improve the effectiveness of the R&D in the United States, the time from basic research to the time it can benefit uh, the human beings needs to be shortened. That's a given. So if you think about this thing, it's actually pushing this chart all over to a little bit to the other side. You can see the curve is going to get steeper, and this is going to be even more convoluted at any given time. And so that's why. We believe the innovation ecosystem ideally should be like this. It's like a nexus. It's the university, industry, the customers, the private, in that, in, uh, the private investors, the entrepreneurs in the startups working very closely together. And they are, they change ideas, they change they, their flow of information, knowledge, ideas, their flow of talent. People move around in different organizations. And also, of course, their flow of capital to enable the technologies and help to work together. So ideally, this ecosystem, this innovation ecosystem should be that very interconnected, very intertwined as a nexus. And within this nexus, what is the what is the role of NSF? We have to ask ourselves, and this is what we come up with. We think that NSF's role in this is being a catalyst. We want to be the one that, when there is a good idea, we want to be seeding the idea. When we know that there is the communities needs to be put together, and this is actually a very good example of that, we need to pull the community together, building that innovation capacity, make sure that community understand from all different disciplines can work together and have the opportunity to work together. And also, the ultimate goal is to help catalyze the expansion of this eco innovation ecosystem and make sure it's healthy. So that's based on this strategy and concept. We, in the last few years, we have been realigned, restructured, and also initiate new translational uh, translational research programs at NSF. The new program is, there's one of them is called AIR, Accelerating Innovation Research, and another one is called Innovation Core. We re realigned our SBRNAS TTR program with a laser focus on technology commercialization and very much focusing on the tech startups instead of just the regular small businesses. We focus on the young and dynamic, high potential, high growth potential startups. And another thing we have done is what my colleagues, Dr. Sally Nerdov and Dr. Alexandria Mandina Bohar is going to talk about is the building innovation capacity program that we restructured the entire program to focus on smart service systems. And there are two reasons we did that. One is we believe we need to build a community to enable the community to work on the smart service systems. And another reason is I personally believe this is actually a good experiment for us to think about the future. If we can, all of us as a community, can figure out and come up with a very solid research agenda at this time to, to know how to move this forward, we can tackle many, many grand challenges moving forward and make sure our research is going to be relevant. So with that, I will turn the podium to my colleague, uh, Dr. Salinolov. Thank you.